Hello, good morning, everybody. I'm really happy and honored to have this opportunity to speak today. Thank you to the organizers for inviting me. Thank you all for being here early in the morning. Um, the work that I'm going to be speaking about today is not our pilot grant from the center. We look forward to reporting back on that at a later date. What I'm going to be speaking about is a study that is EPA funded that I'm doing with my colleagues, Dr. Perry Sheffield at Mount Sinai in New York is my co-principal investigator on this study. And Faustini Amaro, uh, based in Buffalo, New York, is our community engagement consultant. So as a little bit of background for many years now, uh, myself and my lab have been concentrating on trying to understand the environment as relates to health as both a social and a physical entity. So much of my work in the past has focused on things like chronic stressor exposures, particularly violence exposures in urban environments, and how that exposure to a severe or chronic stressor may alter individuals, particularly children's response to physical environmental pollution, notably air pollution or extreme temperature. But we're doing two really interesting things in this study. Number one is we're finally flipping our script. So instead of just talking about the negative things, which we do all the time in public health, we're trying to identify beneficial assets, things that communities can actually do to help improve children's resilience to climate-related exposures like temperature and pollution. We're doing this very much in a specific climate context, and we are extending beyond the urban area. So we've done many years of work looking at uh, communities in Boston, New York, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, but here we're really extending our purview and trying to understand patterning in children's health outcomes across the whole of New York State, which is choosing to be a really fascinating challenge because the entire population gradient of the United States exists within New York State, from highly densely populated Manhattan up to Adirondacks National Park. So the entire population density gradient exists and beautifully, miraculously, we have health data across that entire gradient. So it's a really fascinating opportunity to tear apart what might be going on in both the social and the physical environment across the whole urban rural gradient. So with that as background, let me go ahead and dive in. In this particular study, we're working on identifying resilience enhancing assets that may bolster children's resilience to climate related exposures, again, across the whole of the state, flipping our model and extending across that whole urban rural gradient. We have a few underlying hypotheses in this work. Of course, we're hypothesizing that many communities with high social stressor exposures, such as poverty, may actually have some important assets that we want to identify, build on, and encourage them to, to invest in and make good on to help improve children's health. This could be green space, community centers, what have you. We're also hypothesizing that beneficial assets will be very, very different in urban versus non-urban settings. A great example is a car, a personal vehicle. It's really hard to live in rural upstate New York without access to your own transportation, to have your own vehicle. But in Manhattan, do you really want to keep a vehicle? So think about the difference in what that very critical asset could mean in very different settings. We're also recognizing that some assets um, may, well, we're hypothesizing that some of these assets we identify may buffer susceptibility to pollution and heat, again, differently across the gradient. So most importantly, of course, this is our research team. My co-principal investigator is Perry Sheffield at the Icon School of Medicine in New York. And with Perry at Icon is Cassie Bernardi, Kofi Otter, Alan Just, who recently moved over to Brown University, and Sophia Cardumi Pendley. Uh, Faustini Amaro, I mentioned, is our community engagement consultant in Buffalo. And with me at Drexel are Leah Shinazi, who is uh, faculty also in my department, and my excellent doctoral students, Lisa Fru, Rachit Sharma. And last but not least is Ellen Kinney, who is our brilliant geodata manager, who sits at University of Pittsburgh. And there is not GIS data on the planet that can hide for her, from her. It's truly unbelievable what she can find. Okay. We have a large number of partners on this work because again, we're extending our purview. We've been working in New York City for a decade and a half now, but going statewide, we need some other perspectives and other partners to help us understand the context. So we're working with partners from Department of Conservation, 
Um, importantly, from the Children's Environmental Health Center's network, uh, the NICE Check network across New York City, of which Dr. Sheffield is co-director. They are a network of clinicians serving children who are working on those techniques that Dr. Howith mentioned on really helping clinicians to address climate in the context of messaging, prescriptions, and treatment plans for children and families. We are working with our Rural Health Network. Monarch of Infinite Possibilities is our community consultants again, the Region 2 Pediatric Environmental Health Specialty Unit, Children's Environmental Health Network, the Eco Healthy Child Care Program, and Mount Sinai Center on Health and Environment across the lifespan. And this is how we're operationalizing our framework for this study. So in AIM-1, we are doing quite a bit of work working with our community partners to identify and characterize key assets that exist in different types of communities across the state. And this is a combination of um, implementing a uh, resilience framework, which I'll show you in a moment, identifying GIS-based indicators, that's geographic information systems, mapping indicators for social and environmental assets across the state, and working with our community partners. We are in M2 testing, of course, the health associations between fine particulate matter and other climate-related exposures and temperature with children's health across many different types of communities. Um, testing stressors and assets as effect modifiers in that relationship, and ultimately working with our partners to integrate the findings, identify assets that could potentially be intervened upon in the future, and help them think towards testing interventions that may be efficacious to improve children's health and resilience. And here's our overall framework. We're looking at associations between heat and air pollution on child health, direct associations between community stressors and assets on child health, and effect modification by stressors and assets on the heat and air pollution relationship. Okay, thank you. All right, so here's what we're learning. Again, we've been working with stressors forever, and I can tell you all kinds of interesting things about nuances we've learned in how you have to think about social stressors and measure them differently from environmental pollutants. I'll just put that out there as a potential question, okay? But assets are turning out to be even more complicated. And the reason why is that many assets are working through multiple pathways simultaneously. Let's take green space, for example. There's an explosion of literature right now in the environmental health literature, interest in green space. Most of it is finding beneficial associations towards health, including children's health. However, Green space could be doing a lot of different things. It's a place that may be relatively cool within the city. It's a place for physical activity. It can facilitate social gatherings. It may be a place where people meet each other intentionally or you, you just bump into your neighbors there. Aesthetics and stress pathways may be at play. And of course, it may be acting as a proxy for socioeconomic position because it's more expensive to live near the appealing amenities in your community or in your city. There are, of course, other challenges in identifying and interpreting assets. One is that the presence of an asset in the community doesn't mean that everybody has access to it or that everybody has equal access to it. So a great example I'd like to point out is Tamara Dubowitz's nice work from Pittsburgh, where she found that when you put a high income a expensive grocery store into a low income community, it's not helping to improve food access in the community. And it might actually be a stressor because it's kind of pointing out the disparity that people there can't afford it. So we need to think about the contextualization of assets. Secondly is asset quality differs drastically, but we don't always have that available to us in the GIS data. So just because a park exists on the map or a playground, that doesn't mean the playground equipment is in useful condition, that the park is acceptably clean, that the playground equipment there isn't broken or unsafe in some way. We also don't know whether or not each asset is responsive to community needs. I gave you the example of the grocery store, but you could also say, well, what if a community has four grocery stores? It's not a food desert, but it doesn't have a healthcare center. Clearly, there's a difference in what's actually needed there. So the asset is only useful, this is Economics 101, if there's relative scarcity in that item and therefore it's fulfilling a real need. And then finally, assets can also be stressors. So going back to green space, for example, lots of interest in the topic today. However, there's also a traditional literature from geography showing that 
after dark, a lot of people, particularly women in urban environments, don't feel safe walking through or near green space, parks. So parks can be both a stressor and an asset depending on time of day and who you're talking to. And it's important that we keep that in mind. Okay. I also mentioned that we're extending our work now from the urban setting across the whole urban rural gradient. And we're finding that a lot of things differ across the urban rural gradient. The entire context of the work has changed. So not only is pollution and temperature vastly different far upstate New York compared to in the city, but the population density, the racial and ethnic composition, poverty, you name it, any social or sociodemographic characteristic is drastically different from New York City to the rest of the state. Access to resources is very different. Things are further apart upstate. It's very rural up there. If you get up into Adirondacks National Park, there, again, some of the lowest population densities in the country, resources are very sparse. I've done that two hour drive to the emergency room from the Adirondacks, and that's a long calculus that you make. Do we have to go to the emergency room right now or do we wait until the morning, okay? Stressor exposures is very different. Accessibility of social assets, pretty much everything. Everything's different. So we've gotten ourselves into a pickle. So we decided to work with something called the Resilience Activation Framework published back in 2015 by Abramson and colleagues. This was published in the uh, climate disaster related literature. And we've thought about how can we adapt this for environmental health and environmental epidemiology. And what Abramson did was they identified assets in four different domains, human capital, economic, social capital, political capital, and we added environmental capital to the list. And we, by which I mean my brilliant geodata manager, Ellen, went digging for everything available in GIS data to help us understand the distribution of these very different types of assets across the state and brought them to our partners. And the first question we asked was a silly question. What are we missing? And then, whoa, this list exploded even further. And then we said, mm -hmm, let's go back and ask, where do we focus? Help us focus. What's really important? We can't study everything at well at, at, as well as we would like to if we're trying to do everything at once. So where do we focus in this work to get started? And one thing we heard a lot about right off the bat was schools. Lots of communities wanted to talk to us about schools. When we do focus groups in New York City, everybody wants to talk about violence. When we started talking to partners upstate, everybody wanted to talk about school quality. They also wanted to talk about broadband access. That is also huge. Okay. But there was a lot of concern and questions about school-based programs and quality of school-based programs because clearly people are invested in the well-being of the children in their communities. We're ultimately interested in child health for this study, so it makes sense to focus on a child-specific asset. And there's something really fascinating about schools. It's that schools are simultaneously a physical environment they're a built space. The quality of the schools, whether or not it has air conditioning, the structure of the building says a lot about access to molds, mildews, indoor exposures, but also buffering of outdoor exposures, particularly heat, okay? Uh, schools are at the same time an educational environment. That should be obvious. And they're also a social environment. So my brilliant doctoral student, Lisa Fru, is working on tearing this apart as part of their doctoral thesis. What is it about schools that appears to drive children's health and resilience to uh, climate-related exposures? The other thing that we've learned about schools that's really interesting, particularly in more rural communities, Schools are more than just serving the kids in the community. They are effectively community centers. They were cooling space during heat waves. They were vaccination points of delivery during COVID, et cetera. Oftentimes that school building and the infrastructure in the community provided by schools has bearing far beyond the direct services provided to children and families. Okay. And because we're working with children's health across the state, we realized, wow, we're talking to too many adults. 
we really need to talk to some young people and get their perspectives on climate, their perspectives on assets, and we need their insight into what is the school experience these days? What's going on that we're not going to see or we're not going to know when we're talking to a bunch of other adults? So we launched our youth advisory panel this year. It's largely made up of 15 to 21 year olds. So they're on the, the older age of the spectrum, but they've really developed some strong opinions and they're ready to speak out and we can do IRB and all of that stuff with them. Um, we have 14 panelists recruited to date, and they first convened recently in late May, and they're really enjoying getting to know each other because kids from New York City haven't necessarily met kids from Buffalo or really rural communities in their state before. So it's really a neat and fun learning opportunity for them to get together with young people from very different contexts. Okay, and I'll just share some very quick epidemiologic results to wrap up. From our preliminary case, case crossover models, so we are looking here at short-term changes in temperature and air pollution as affects risk of child emergency department visit on a given day, comparing it to, let's say we're looking at a Monday in June, comparing it to the other Mondays in June. So it's a time stratified case crossover, looking at short term environmental exposures and relative risks. So this method is very well suited to looking at temporally varying environmental exposures like pollution and temperature. And because individuals are compared to themselves, we're inherently adjusting for all of those difficult confounders that are so hard to adjust for in most epidemiologic designs. It's also very well suited to look at effect modification without being overly confounded by all those other things. We're using statewide data on all child emergency department visits and hospitalizations, which is provided to us by the New York State Department of Health Statewide Planning and Research Cooperative. This is a system into which, by law, all the emergency departments and hospitals in New York have to deliver their data. We have access to each child's residential address. We are point geocoding all the children. Of course, we have different data at different uh, institutions within our work so we're able to keep full um, non-identifiability. This is, believe it or not, actually our sample size 22 million emergency department visits. So we have the privilege of being able to slice the data and dice the data and look at effect modification in many different ways. Okay, so very preliminarily, uh, these are associations for fine particle exposures across the state on child emergency department visits, looking across lag days. So lag day zero is the case day, the day the child arrives in the emergency room, lag day one is day before, lag day two is two days before, and so on. And what we're finding consistently across the four different groupings of community subcategory by urbanicity is that we're getting very acute lag day zero, that same day effects of fine particulate exposure on child emergency department visits. So it's same day pollution exposure, same day events coming into the emergency department. Again, across the board, across the entire urban rural gradient. We are finding that associations between fine particulate exposure and ED visits is nonlinear. So here, what you're looking at are the percent excess risk comparisons for, for example, um, concentrations of six micrograms per meter cube versus one microgram per meter cube, 11 micrograms per meter cube versus six micrograms per meter cubed and so on. And what you'll see is that we're finding stronger excess risk at the very low end of exposures. So there's a nonlinear effect of fine particulate matter on child health with stronger effects per unit per microgram per meter cubed increase in PM at the low end of the curve. And then finally, looking at very preliminarily effect modification of fine particulate matter effects on emergency department visits by socioeconomic position or poverty. We are finding weaker associations for fine particulate matter on child ED visits in high poverty census tracts. And that effect is right here. It only shows up in high density urban areas. So think Manhattan. And we are seeing it again at the very low end of the concentration curve for fine particulate matter. So, 
Okay. So the question was, is this a repeatable uh, result or is this unique to New York City? Of course, we don't technically know. And as we go forward, we'll be replicating some of our analyses in New York in the mid-sized cities upstate, the Buffaloes, Albany's, Rochester's of the world. So we'll be able to tell you more about that. Um, we don't, however, see that effect as clearly in, say, the lower density urban where many of those smaller cities probably show up. Uh, it is not statistically significant. One reason why that may be, and this is hearkening back to a prior life, uh, from 2008 to 2010, I worked for New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, running a huge air pollution exposure study for them in the city, known as the New York City Community Air Survey. It's the largest study that's been done to date, just monitoring fine, fine particles and a whole host of other pollutants within one city. And we had a very unusual result, which is the highest pollution in New York City is actually in the Upper East Side. The single wealthiest census tracts in the country also had extraordinarily high pollution and extraordinarily high, uh, particularly nickel, but other heavy metal exposures in their air. Uh, so that did drive a lot of policy change in the city quite quickly. Oil burning. It was oil burning. So that, yeah, so that study is the reason why a lot of oil burning regulations changed very quickly around 2011, 2012 in New York. Yeah, yeah. Wealthy people don't want their kids exposed to airborne metals and and have the political power to make changes. Okay. What were, were there other questions on that or should I go ahead and wrap up? I'll go ahead and wrap up. Okay. Um, so next steps, we're continually working with our statewide partners, continuing to gather further input on interpreting all of these assets that we're working with, uh, sharing preliminary findings with them, discussing potential interventions and climate messaging down the road. In the epidemiology, we're shifting from stressors more explicitly into those assets, building all those indicators now. And we're running statewide principal components analysis, spatially stratified PCAs to help us understand common patterning among stressors, assets, and pollutants and temperature, because a huge risk in this world is mistaking the effect of one social stressor for another or one social asset for another, because these things are very much clustered and patterned by socioeconomic position. We're examining effect modification in these case crossover analyses. We are um, starting to dig into more specific diagnoses of interest. This is overall ED visits. Uh, one particular area that we're looking at are seizure and epilepsy outcomes in kids, also mental health and asthma outcomes. And finally, we're developing spatial hierarchical Bayesian models, which is a fascinating approach that basically allows us to map effect estimates across space and look at clustering and effect estimates and how that clustering and patterning may be explained by social stressors and assets. So with that, I will go ahead and wrap up. Thank you to all of you for your time and attention this morning. Okay.